I'm really excited that you're here with me and that we're on this journey together. As I mentioned, the course has really helped me throughout my life. And by example, it's helped me through breakups. It's helped me learn to embrace my solitude and replace these feelings of loneliness with some creative parts of me that I didn't really know existed. Deep in my meditation practice, and it heals my post-traumatic stress disorder. So I firmly believe that the messages this text has to offer is beneficial for anyone. And the text is pretty hefty, so. I'm going to be reading to you parts of the text as well as interpreting them myself to you and giving my personal experience as well. So here we go. This is A Course in Miracles. This is little me. <laughs> and I would like to begin by their own introduction so you know who this book is coming from and what it is about. A Course in Miracles began with the sudden decision of two people to join in a common goal. Their names were Helen Schumann and William Thetford professors of medical psychology at Columbia University's College of Physicians and Surgeons in New York City. Psychologist, educator, conservative in theory, and atheist in belief, I was working in a prestigious and highly academic setting. And then something happened that triggered a chain of events I could have never predicted. The head of my department unexpectedly announced that he was tired and angry of the aggressive attitudes and feelings that reflected <laughs> and concluded that there must be another way. As if on cue, I agreed to help him find it. Apparently this course is the other way. Although Christian in statement, the course deals with universal and spiritual themes. It emphasizes that it is but one version of the universal curriculum. There are many others, but this one differing from them only in form. They all lead to God in the end. If you're sensitive to the word God, you can replace it with universe. Sometimes I'll replace it with universe for you. And I've been there. I've been there when I question such a thing as God, when I look around the world and I see chaos or violence or people hurting and not getting the help that they need. And so I question God, where are you? And I don't understand the concept. This really helps. So whether you're sensitive to the word God, you can substitute it for universe or creator. We all come from something. We're here. It's not an evolutionary thing. It's not scientifically based, but there has been a text on quantum physics that explain theories of the universe that this text actually relates to. One of those books is called The Disappearance of the Universe. It's by a guy from Maine whose name is evading me right now, but you can check it out. Google The Disappearance of the Universe. Remember only this, you need not believe in ideas, you need only to accept them, and you need not even to welcome them. Some of them you may actively resist. None of this will matter or decrease their efficacy. But do not allow yourself to make exceptions in applying the ideas the workbook contains. In whatever your re reception, or in, in whatever your reaction to the ideas may be, use them. Nothing more than this is required. I'm reading a lot of this because it's really important, and these videos aren't necessarily going to be brief. They'll probably be about 10 minutes each just so you know, and for a heads up. This is, took me a long time to get through my first year, literally almost a year before I finished it because the concepts are so deep that sometimes you can only read a couple pages at a time and you're just like brain fried. And then to go with the lesson along with it is another thing in itself. So that's why we'll be reading a couple pages at a time and going through the lesson together. So whether you decide to purchase the text and follow along or just listen, 
You're not missing out, just listening. The course is the beginning, not an end. No more specific lessons are assigned, for there is no more need of them. Henceforth, hear but the voice of God, or the voice of your higher potential self. If you believe in manifestation and that you are the creator of your reality based on your thoughts and intentions, then you can believe that in a perfect universe, there is a perfect you. And by a perfect you, it doesn't mean uh, those things that you think it means. It means that you are just a holy, healed being in alignment with unconditional love. That's the highest energy that we can put out in the universe and that we can believe the universe vibrates with. So believe in yourself, believe in your higher self, if that's who you wanna connect with. Your mind's potential, as you know, it grows and it evolves from when you were young to where you are now. And you never knew that you would have these ideas, this brilliance, this intelligence that you do now. So just imagine the evolution that your mind can handle, that's all in here. We just are opening our mind to receive it, to receive it now. So we have to change our perspective from ego-centric, fear-based, judgment-based thoughts against ourselves and against the world and against our conditional ideas that we've been taught to believe in. And we have to learn to love ourselves and to think with love so we can vibrate with our higher self and so that new thoughts can come into our mind through that vibration. That's a quantum physics thing. He will direct your efforts, telling you exactly what to do, how to direct your mind, and when to come to him in silence, asking for his sure direction in a certain world. And you can do that. The same in your meditation is in your silence, pray to your higher self by yourself. Help me to realize or see this in a different light. And you will follow that new course. It's there. This is how A Course in Miracles begins. It makes a fundamental distinction between the real and the unreal, between knowledge and perception. Knowledge is truth, one law, the law of love or God. Knowledge is truth under one law. Forgive me, I'm not the best reader. Truth is unalterable, eternal, and unambiguous. It can be unrecognized, but it cannot be changed. It applies to everything that God created, and only what he created is real. It has no opposite, no beginning, and no end. It merely is, and it exists in the present moment. So as we go through this course, I want you to practice meditation as well whether it's two minutes a day, five minutes a day, or 20 minutes a day. The more you learn to become present is when you open yourself up to these new ideas to come through. If you are constantly anxious about the past or the future, and you're letting those thoughts just keep living in your mind, there's no space for you to change your mind or to have a new realization or to think new thoughts because your mind is full. The world of perception, on the other hand, is the world of time, of change, of beginnings and endings. It is based on interpretation, not on facts. It is the world of birth and death, founded on the belief in scarcity, loss, separation, and death. It is learned rather than given, selective in its perpetual emphasis, unstable in its functioning, and inaccurate in its interpretations. It is the Holy Spirit's goal to help us escape from the dream world by teaching us how to reverse our thinking and unlearn our mistakes. Forgiveness is the Holy Spirit's great learning aid in bringing this thought reversal about. However, the Course has its own definition of what forgiveness really is, just as it defines the world in its own way. The world we see merely reflects our own internal frame of reference. The dominant ideas, wishes, and emotions in our minds, projection makes perception. We look inside first, decide the kind of world we want to see, and then we project that world outside, making it truth as we see it. 
If we are using perception to justify our own mistakes, our anger, our impulses to attack, our love, our lack of love in whatever form it may take, we will see a world of evil, destruction, malice, envy, and despair. All this we must learn to forgive, not because we are being good and charitable, but because what we are seeing is not true, not in a world of unconditional love. Unconditional love you want to think of as a spectrum of light, the brightest light that exists. With light, there is a shadow, and that shadow is fear and judgment. And as soon as we turn the light on that shadow, it doesn't exist anymore. The shadow is our interpretations, those creative things about us that we've learned, that society has created, that our peers influence us with, that our parents embedded in our minds. These are all things that have been learned. And you may be to a point in your life when you realize these things no longer serve you. You may even realize that the way things aren't working out in your life are because you happen to think this way and believe this way. Those things are untrue because they are conditional. If the universe is one, and we are one with the universe, and all minds are connected as one, which we know to be true based on energy. Energy, we know we're all existing at very high frequencies. Frequencies that make us into this form that we are, that form ourselves, that form our body, that form our minds. And so at an energetic form, there's no boundary where my energy doesn't connect with the energy of another. No, we are one. And so that's how a miracle can occur, is through the mind of another, through communication. And you realize that it's not just sinking into your mind, these new ideas, it is sinking into the mind of one. That's how this universe ultimately works in terms of change. We all have to be on the same page. I know that sounds like a lofty goal, and given all the different faiths and cultures and disagreements, that it may never be achieved. But you can change that just by changing the world around you. That starts with changing yourself. People notice, and it's a domino effect. The more dominoes we have, well, the more we raise our vibration toward love, the more peace can come to the world because we'll be creative enough to bring it about. Sin is defined as lack of love. Since love is all there is, sin is the sight of the Holy Spirit. Sin in the sight of the Holy Spirit is a mistake to be corrected rather than an evil to be punished. Our sense of inadequacy, weakness, and incompletion comes from the strong investment in the scarcity principle that governs the whole world of illusions. From that point of view, we seek in others what we feel is wanting in ourselves. We love another in order to get something for ourselves. That can be called codependency, can be stemmed from a fear of being alone, can be a belief that you're not good enough and someone else is, and so you kind of uh, pull off of their energy and really that feeling beneath the subconscious of the pulling is envy, and it's coming from lack of love. So we need to not see outside of ourselves and judge that we are different. We need to see within that we are first love and so are they. And there's no difference. The more we learn to love and embrace ourselves, this can work. That in fact is what passes for love in the dream world. There can be no greater mistake than that for love is incapable of asking for anything. Only minds can really join, and whom God has joined, no man can put asunder. It is, however, only at the level of Christ's mind that true union is possible, and has, in fact, never been lost. The little eye seeks to enhance itself by external approval, external possessions, and external love. The self that God created needs nothing. It is forever complete, safe, loved, and loving. It seeks to share rather than to get, to extend rather than to project. It has no needs and wants to join in others out of their mutual awareness of abundance. That's all I'm going to go for now. 
in the introduction so that I can read you guys the first lesson here and some excerpt from the text of the beginning. I just wanted you to understand the where this came from is two scholars, one atheist who didn't believe in anything. And this text came about and shifted their worlds. And as you know, it was in a work setting that things weren't working out. And so they took it upon themselves to see how can we make that change? Once they made that change within, the change around them began to happen too. It can't help it because you are the conduit and you are the only one. You listening to this, you are the only one. And so you are the conduit of what is happening around you. You're not a victim of your external circumstance. You can change it. So now, if you're ready, we'll go on to lesson one.